Temple Knight. Regardless of whether you're a fan of the series or not, one thing is undeniable. Pokemon is absolutely a raving success. It is, year after year, the highest grossing media franchise of all time. Bigger than Star Wars, bigger than the MCU, bigger than Mickey Mouse, bigger than Harry Potter. This little unassuming yellow mouse hailing from Viridian Forest represents a monolithic influential force of media, earning itself a day one spot in Super Smash Bros. and a delightfully rotund float in the Macy's Day Parade every single year. Though absolutely a marvel from a capitalistic standpoint, today I want to talk about all of the touchy-feely things that led to Pokemon becoming such a phenomenon. From the perspective of someone who was there to watch it happen in 1998 as soon as it hit the states. I want to break this down because I feel like there are some really understated elements in Pokemon's design and conception that aren't given enough attention, and thinking about this has made me think about yet another special magical thing that we experience in gaming in general that I don't think anyone talks about. I'm mostly focusing on Gens 1 through 3 with this video because this era of Pokemon built the foundations of what eventually made it what it is today. It was lightning in a bottle in its purest sense back then, and I think the limitations of the technology these games were produced for actually helped facilitate the things that made those early days of Pokemon in particular feel so magical. It's pretty well documented at this point that one of the inspirations behind Pokemon's design, specifically the ability to trade and capture Pokemon, came from creator Satoshi Tajiri's childhood hobby of collecting insects. From its very inception, Pokemon was created with the interests of children and the wonderment children possess for the world around them in mind. If you think about it, pretty much every element present within Pokemon's stories, settings, and concepts can be traced back to would a little boy or girl find this cool? And while the natural world is vast and everyone comes from different backgrounds, I think there are some common interests that children from all over the world have, and I think Pokemon has expertly woven those niche, unspoken interests into the fabric of its world setting. Speaking from the perspective of a boy myself, and considering that Satoshi's inspiration for Pokemon came from his specific lived childhood experience, maybe there are some elements I'm missing here, or elements that I'm assuming are present that aren't entirely accurate for everyone else since I can only speak from my own perspective, but I would be willing to bet that at least 95% of you watching have thought about at least half of these things during your childhood. Considering that I'm apparently horrible at cultivating a multi-gender audience, oh my god, I think it's a safe bet to make some assumptions here about what you guys liked as kids. If you're watching this and you're a girl from the other side of the pond, for example, I would love to hear about your non-American, non-stinky boy experience with Pokemon in the comments below if you feel comfortable doing so. With that said, here are the four things that I think pretty much every little boy has thought about at some point in their childhood. When I start listing these, think about Pokemon and you may see where I'm going here. The first is the desire to run away or go on an adventure. This desire doesn't necessarily mean you hate your parents or your life or anything like that, it's just that you're thinking there must be something more out there. You want to go out and discover the world, just like you see your heroes on TV or in games, books, or movies do. You can find this in any Pokemon game. The second is a desire to have a secret base or hideout. Kids, especially those who grew up near the woods and use their imaginations to play, love to feel as if they found something secret or cultivated something secret that no one else knows about. Maybe it's this exclusive club and very likely it's really nothing all that special, but to a kid's imagination, there's just something really cool about having your own special base of operations to, I don't know, fight imaginary ninjas or something like that. We were first able to create secret bases of our own in Gen 3, but we were taking out the enemy Team Rocket's secret strongholds as early as Gen 1. And oddly enough, little sidebar here, what inspired a lot of these thoughts was a tweet I saw somewhere where someone shared the story about the Roof Ninja Lady, you know, that lady that managed to carve out a little space of her own behind a store sign and she was there for like, ever. And that tweet said that she was basically living every little boy's dream to escape and create a secret base, and I think that tweet was absolutely accurate. Alright, and to the third one, here's a simple one. Trees are really cool. Perhaps a better description would be just the desire to get out in nature, but trees are really cool is basically my why say lot word when few word do trick type of thing. Something about the way trees are is just so sick. You can look at an aspen tree and tell that it's an aspen just because of the way that it is. Hopefully today they still inspire you because they're pretty freaking important. And I don't know a single kid who has at least never tried to climb a tree or thought about it, and just being around one is grounding. Now vast forests and things like that are in all of the games, but it comes full circle in Gen 3 when we are able to visit Fortree City. 
And now the fourth one is incredibly important. I call this who would win in a fight between a bear and a gorilla. Now chances are just reading that or hearing that you're already trying to answer my question and that's a good thing because that's how I know I'm right. In my experience whether I'm talking to a five-year-old or a 50-year-old anyone I ask this question has some thoughts to share and they tend to ramble and ruminate on it a lot longer than they expect to. Of course, Pokemon battling, much to PETA's dismay, has been around since the beginning, and this fundamental question is at the core of why Pokemon battling is appealing. These four ideas form the foundations of what makes Pokemon intriguing to a young person on a fundamental, conceptual level, without even seeing or knowing what a Pokemon is. Now let's take these concepts and build upon this foundation to turn Pokemon into something so sick that a kid isn't even aware they wanted something like Pokemon until they see it. When Pokemon Red and Blue first hit the states, it also launched with the Pokemon anime, a well-animated show with lots of likable characters, cute beasts that feel more like animal companions rather than monsters, stories with a lot of heart, and an eye-catching art style that was finally on the rise in appeal with Western audiences thanks to the breakthrough mainstream success of anime like Dragon Ball Z which helped pave the way. The trading card game launched in 1999, featuring the wonderful Ken Sugimori watercolor anime fusion artwork that would go on to become so iconic and so nostalgic for many of us today, and the trading card game itself actually had enough substance to it to ensure that it would be something people would still enjoy playing today, not just a fad to burn out within a year or so because of a lack of depth or something like that. The game's launching with version exclusivity meant that while my Pokemon story playing the blue version was mostly the same as the story my friend who played Pokemon Red experienced, the slight differences that we saw in game fueled countless playground stories. Even if, in truth, me talking about the Mankey I got and you talking about the Meowth you got in the same area is kind of the equivalent of saying my tattoo says dude and yours says sweet, it provided enough intrigue to keep kids talking every morning before class to see what was going on in the other world that they weren't able to play in. This would go on to fuel rumor mill conversations, and I think these conversations were the genesis for things that eventually led to the infamous Mew underneath the truck, or or peekaboo stories perpetuated by the early internet and gaming magazines. There was a fine line between reality and fiction that was blurred so often that if someone told you you could find some weird Pokemon no one knows by watching an old man demonstrate how to catch one, then flying to Cinnabar Island and surfing along the island shore until it appears, you probably wouldn't believe them. And then once they told you that you could evolve it into a Rhydon or Kangaskhan with the ability to fly, you really wouldn't believe them. But the intrigue of that and the easiness by which you can do it might make you want to explore that possibility to find out if it is true, and once you find out that this actually is something that you can do, now you don't know what rumors to believe because this defied all expectations. And then the cycle continues. Then we get to Pokemon trading. Again, harking back to Satoshi Tajiri's memories of bug collecting, with Game Boy Link cables you could go meet up with a friend at the schoolyard in real life and trade Pokemon you caught with Pokemon that they caught. The simple act of being able to trade or battle Pokemon via Link cable was probably the spark for many child childhood friendships and maybe frenemies. In fact, I would argue that trading Pokemon via the Game Boy Link Cable is one of the most important examples of video games encouraging human interaction across multiple systems. Alongside both the games that came before it, like Street Fighter 2 and the arcades encouraging people to meet up and see who can defeat whose Dragon Punch, for example, to the online multiplayer games that came after, like WoW and RuneScape, that allowed us to connect on a global scale and scam people into thinking that we were going to trim their armor for free. I don't know, I never did that. I just read about that. I promise. All of this, the anime debuting during a rise of anime's popularity in the US, the iconic monster designs, the trading card game, version exclusive Pokemon and the conversations and rumors that that generated, the need to go out in real life and trade Pokemon with friends if you wanted to truly catch them all, all of this then culminated into the release of the Pokemon movies. And these movies, more than anything else, captivated audiences by capitalizing on the mystery surrounding the Pokemon universe, fueling the fire for more schoolyard conversations that led children to think of Pokemon's world as one that's vast and limitless with endless possibility and room for discovery. The movies expanded the Pokemon universe's lore with new Pokemon and Pokemon that literally embodied the definition of words like legendary or mythical, as many Pokemon featured in the movies were either hard to obtain or not possible to obtain at the time. Pokemon the first movie, also known as Mewtwo Strikes Back, introduces legitimately one of the sickest anime villain origin stories of all time in the form of Mewtwo, as well as the mysterious gentle Mew itself, and very likely made a lot of kids cry for the very first time in a theater with its tearjerk moments. Seriously, this movie gets really sad. Then Pokemon 2000 introduced us to Lugia and the legendary birds. Pokemon 3 gave us the unknown 
villains and legendary dogs. And during the time of the second movie, kids got that amazing ancient Mew card that I'm still sad that I seem to have misplaced many years ago. But take notice, on those ancient Mew cards were unknown inscriptions. Remember that Ho-Oh, who didn't appear as a catchable Pokemon until Pokemon Gold and Silver, can be seen in the very first episode of the Pokemon anime, which debuted a little over two years prior. The Pokemon Company, through its show and movies especially, was able to capitalize on the curiosity of its fans by constantly dropping little seeds of mystery into everything it did, and that kept the kids hooked. Now, the games also had to be really good for this whole thing to work too, and thankfully they were a massive success. It didn't hurt that it released on the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance, which were just killing it. While not the first in the monster capturing RPG genre that goes to Megami Tensei, Pokemon was able to attain more mainstream success by somewhat avoiding the satanic panic of the 90s, keyword somewhat. And if you're not familiar, this is where parents were up in arms about anything that could be misconstrued as even a little satanic. Growing up in the Bible Belt myself, I dealt with my fair share of being told that I would burn forever for wrecking Pokemon Blue with a Farfetch'd for some reason, but I think Pokemon's rather cute and mostly innocuous designs allowed people to eventually come to their senses and realize that this isn't an inherently evil franchise mostly come to their senses. Precursors like Megami Tensei and Dragon Quest V with their more demonic monster designs wouldn't have stood a chance with angry American moms. And I think part of the reason Digimon was never quite as successful as Pokemon was that while it did have some cute monsters, you also can't quite shake the feeling that even the cutest of these monsters could also knock your block off with ease if you said the wrong thing to them. I mean, as much as I love Agumon, look at the veins on this guy's arms. So Pokemon was able to eventually, slowly, skirt itself out of harm's way for the most part during the satanic panic, and if your parents never let you play for that reason, I'm sorry, hopefully you're able to play them now and enjoy them. And with each new Pokemon game, the series iterated upon the previous in some shape or form to hopefully improve the experience of its players, and that's what helped keep them coming. For those out of the loop on the beginning generations, or those who may want a recap, I'll quickly go over the changes that were brought across each gen. This isn't a completely comprehensive overview of everything added into these games, but in general, here's how the games improved over time. Keep in mind, for the first three generations, you usually had two version exclusives, and then a more quote-unquote definitive version released later which often had sprite, glitch, and story-related fixes in addition to everything else I'm about to mention. We started everything off with Pokemon Red and Blue, which introduced us to the world of Pokemon with 151 potential mons to catch. These games also introduced us to its accessible and easy-to-understand RPG battling system with a surprising amount of depth and begin the train of giving us a story with enough substance for both kids and adults, introducing gym leaders and the Elite Four and all of that. Yellow more closely aligned Gen 1 with the anime and gave us Pikachu from the get-go. Pokemon Gold and Silver gave us 100 more pokes for a total of 251, a day and night cycle where certain Pokemon could only be caught at certain times of the day, the ability to explore not only Johto but Kanto, which was freaking crazy. These games also split the special stat into special attack and special defense, which helped Pokemon gameplay get a little more nuance, and even added some new typings in the form of Dark and Steel. Crystal version brought us the option to play as a female protagonist for the first time and introduce the Battle Tower. Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire added 135 new Pokemon for a new total of 386. It introduced double battles which have become a staple of competitive gameplay ever since. It added Pokemon abilities which affect the gameplay further. Pokemon contests which were eh. And one of my favorite features with still untapped potential in my opinion, Gen 3 introduced secret bases. Emerald added the Battle Frontier and some post-game story changes as well as the Pokemon that you can catch. Gen 3 unfortunately didn't have the day and night cycle like Gen 2, but it does also introduce changing weather and weather-based attacks and abilities. Cast form fans rise up! <laughs> so Pokemon managed to capture the imaginations of children and then hold on to those imaginations through its fantastic games. It seemed as if it had this ever-expanding lore. The marketing campaign for this franchise was near perfectly paced and continuously elevated its brand, and Pokemon also proved to be successful in pretty much every medium that it took a shot in. But again, this isn't just a capitalistic analysis of Pokemon. I've been describing this concept throughout this whole video. Pokemon was also especially adept at making us do this one specific activity really well, which I've never heard a term for, so much like I did with secondhand nostalgia, I'll say my term for it. Pokemon was extremely successful, perhaps the most successful of any franchise ever, at making us participate in what I call in-between gaming. And though my focus is on gaming for this channel, this is something transferable to any hobby, so anyone who's very interested in 
in movies or books or anything else can relate to this as well. Let me explain what in-between gaming is to me. A pain that kids know all too well is that waiting period. Waiting for that clock to strike and signal that it's time to get out of school, then you're waiting on the school bus, looking out the window as the trees whiz by, all while thinking about what adventure you're going to go on next when you get into your room. And if you continue to be a bookworm, a cinephile, or a video game enthusiast well into adulthood, this waiting period is something you're still very much acquainted with due to your ever-growing list of mounting responsibilities. So it doesn't matter if you're riding in the backseat of your parents' car with your new shiny game in hand, thumbing through the pages of its manual as a kid, or if you're driving yourself home on your way from work as fast as you can, occasionally glancing at that tiny plastic passenger and wondering just how good your afternoon will be because of it. Drive carefully though, please. In both of these phases of life, we're playing that familiar waiting game, the one that tries to teach you patience. Waiting kind of sucks, doesn't it? And though the experience of playing the waiting game often feels more punishing than the worst of what the Souls games have to offer, I've come to really appreciate dwelling within that period of time. In fact, I'd argue that the pockets of time you spend away from games is the single most important element to solidifying your love for a game and constructing meaningful memories of and within that game. If you're the type of person like myself who, when away from the game you're really into, spends time lost in your head thinking about that game, you understand what I'm talking about. These are those windows of time that you spend to properly digest the story, to theorycraft truths about its world, to imagine the possibilities of what may happen next, and to develop headcanons about your favorite characters and story events. All of these things then work in tandem to strengthen the bond that you have with that game, regardless of whether your ideas end up aligning with what actually happens in it. Again, I refer to this part of gaming as in-between gaming which is that critical period of time you spend your mind analyzing, reflecting, and or theorycrafting various elements of a game outside of the time you actively spend playing it. Sure, you may not be playing the game during this moment, but you might as well be because your mind is definitely anywhere but where you actually are in the physical world right now. I think that the time we spend in between gaming is the source from where our most interesting thoughts surrounding a game originate from, and is also responsible for a lot of the conversations that we have with one another that allow us to connect over our mutual love for a game. When you're able to decompress and reflect on what you just experienced, that's where a lot of your best thoughts surrounding the game come from. And like I said, I think you would be hard pressed to find a gaming franchise that was really able to capitalize on the power of in-between gaming more than Pokemon. To many, this tiny cartridge meant everything. While you may have spent an upwards of 100 plus or 200 plus hours in just one game alone as a kid because we were stupid and got lost all the time, chances are you spent a lot of additional time outside of the game thinking about the game. And though technically speaking Pokemon Red and Blue weren't big games, in fact the file size of those games amount to like 373 kilobytes of memory, which nowadays is substantially smaller than the average photo that we take on our smartphones, Pokemon felt huge. When we zoom into the towns of this game, you'll pretty quickly realize that these towns barely qualify as towns. Many of them only contain a few buildings at maximum, and even the bigger cities in the game like Celadon City contain less than 20 buildings, with a solid chunk of those not even being accessible. And I know that this isn't a feature unique to just Pokemon of course, this is in just about every game you can think of, but it's still fascinating to consider. Pallet Town, where you start the game, has 3 buildings and 8 NPCs if you don't include the rival. That's hardly enough people to run a busy Starbucks for a week, let alone enough people to consider this area a town. And yet, even still, Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow, especially at the time of their release, felt huge. And these worlds only continued to expand as we made our way to Gold, Silver, Crystal, and later to Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald. These nine games, and then everything else the Pokemon company was able to create around them, made Pokemon feel so much bigger than it actually was. It felt like a real, breathing, living place with real people and real creatures. And because of its success, it really did become something big. Pokemon is a legitimate staple of human culture. And I don't know if we'll ever see another franchise quite capture the imaginations of children the same way that Pokemon did worldwide from 1996 to 2004 and continues to do so today. There is a lot to discuss here. I'd love to know your thoughts on Pokemon's beginnings. I'd like to know what games felt like they were more than just games to you. What games you spent the most time in between gaming with. And I'd like to know if Pokemon still captures your imagination today after all of these years. I think I'll leave it at that, but if you're still here, thanks so much for watching, and as always, stay humble.